What we're going to do today is to have a look in the Talmud Bavli, in the Babylonian Talmud. Many, many students who first see the page of Gemara, a page from the Talmud for the first time, are immediately confused. So much text, so much to look at. What does it all mean? Who does it all, who was it written for? Who was it written by? Well, don't get nervous. We're going to have a look at that today, and by the end of the day, hopefully we'll be able to navigate a daf, a page from the Talmud Bavli. So here we are. We're looking now at the first page in the Babylonian Talmud, the very first page written. And what we're going to do to start to look at this page, because as you see, as I mentioned before, it seems to have a lot of text on it, a lot going on. But we'll see it's actually very simple to take apart. We're going to be zooming on at the beginning, the towards the top of the page, and we're going to be looking at four pieces of information that the heading of the page gives us before we actually start with the information. Even though uh, Hebrew is read from right to left, uh, we're actually going to start explaining it from left to right. I hope that doesn't confuse anybody. And uh, let's look at the beginning. I'm highlighting now the first, there's a letter on the left side, the letter bet. The letter bet is simply the page number. The fancier word they use is the folio number. I have no idea in the world why anybody would use that. Their name is page. I guess that has a meaning somewhere. And it's page bet. So it starts with page bet, corresponds to English is two. And it happens to be that the Babylonian Talmud begins always with the letter bet. Why not number one? Why not Aleph? I do not know. I'm not sure anybody knows for sure, but very possibly has to do with the Midrash that tells us that the Torah doesn't start with the Aleph, or rather starts with the Bet Breshit, because Bet stands for Bracha, for blessing, and perhaps that's true here also, and therefore we don't want to start with the letter 1, Aleph, rather the letter 2, Bet. Bet stands for Bracha. As I said, a possibility. Interestingly enough, the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, which we are not discussing today, actually does start with the letter Aleph. Uh, whatever, we start with bet. So that's the page number. And the way the pages work in the Talmud is you have the bet here. The flip side of this page is not daf gimel. Each uh, two sides of a page go for only one page number. So, so to speak, you have 2a, which is this side, and 2b, which would be the flip side of this. Usually the flip side in most Talmuds have no marking whatsoever. You just got to flip it back over to find out what page you're on. And it, only when you turn to what normally we would call page 3 do you get to the letter Gimel. So, but this page will only have the letter Bet. This is called Bet Amud Aleph. That's Bet, this side of the page. And when you flip the page, it's called Bet Amud Bet. Bet side 2, so to speak. So you would have page 2 side 1 and page 2 side B. And that's the way every single Talmud page in the Talmud Bavli, in the Babylonian Talmud, is set up. So whenever you quote a page, you will say, well, it's in Daf Bet, Daf Gimel, Daf Dalet. Someone will always ask you, did you mean Amud Aleph, side A, or Amud Bet, side B? Very, very simple. Each page alone, again, is called an Amud. The pages together is called a Daf, where the word that is mostly used in Yeshivat is Blat. Blot, okay? I'm not exactly sure where that word comes from. It's not really that important. So in uh, in Israel, you may get the word daf used a little more. In the American yeshivas, you may get the word blot. So you'll say, what blot is it on, or what daf is it on? And they will, therefore would tell you, well, it's on bet amud aleph, or bet amud bet. Okay? Hopefully that's clear to everybody. We're moving right along now. And if you go a little to your right, I'm now highlighting the word brachot. Brachot tells you the name of the Mesechet that you are in, the name of the whole volume, if you will. And this one is called Brachot, and uh, in English the word for Mesechet is Tractate. I don't know if anyone in this world knows what the word Tractate actually means, and therefore why bother using it? I have no idea. Let's just use the word, the Hebrew word Mesechet, Mesechet Brachot. That's the name of the entire volume, is Mesechet Brachot. If we move over one to the right, it tells you what chapter of that of that tractate I used it myself, sorry about that, of that Masechet are you in? And this is Perak Rishon, chapter number one. 
So it tells you what chapter, what Masechet you're in, what page in that Masechet. And if you go one more over to the right, what I'm highlighting now is the word Me'imatai. Me'imatai simply tells you the name of the chapter. The name of the chapter, 99.9% of the time, there's some slight variations, will always be simply the first word in the chapter. Okay, it's real, real simple. Coming across now, we'll go now from right to left. We start with Me'imatai, the name of the chapter. Perek Rishon, the number of the chapter, first chapter. Brachot, the name of the Masechet. Careful, didn't say tractate there. Okay, the name of the, tra- of the Masechet. And Bet is the number of this page. So if you see the number, by the way, again, you always know you're on Amud Aleph. On the first side of this blot or this daf, the flip side of the other side of this page would be bet amud bet. Okay? Hopefully that's clear to everybody and real simple. We return now to the full page of the first daf, the first page of Mesecha Brachot, as we've discussed, daf bet amud aleph. And we're now going to turn our attention to the text itself. And we are going to, in this lesson, we're going to look at four areas in the text and perhaps in a later lesson look at the indexes on the t- page itself. But right now again on four areas of the text they will be the Mishnah, the Gemara, Rashi, and Tosfat. To uh, fully appreciate what we're going to be looking at now first let's turn our attention to a chart and take a one minute Jewish history lesson. The chart in front of you displays six kufot, six eras in Jewish history that pertain directly to the development of the oral law of Torah Sheba Al Peh. They begin with the era of the Tanaim. The Tanaim are also known as the rabbis of the Mishnah. And they're the first level here. The Tanaim lived from approximately the year minus 100 to the year 200. That means they lived during the destruction, the Churban, of the second Beit HaMikdash. And the Tanaim are, all the rabbis mentioned in the Mishnah are old Tanaim. Uh, actually, the word Tana in Aramaic, a Shin in Hebrew, translates many times as a Tuf in Aramaic. And therefore, Tanaim in Hebrew would be called Shanaim, from the Shoresh Shin Nun He, which uh, reflects the word Vishinantam Levanecha, to teach diligently to your children, to teach over and over repeating. Tanaim actually, re- the word actually means repeaters. And they taught by repeating things, because Torah Shabal Peh, as the name connotes, the oral law was taught orally until written down in the era of the Tanaim, as we'll talk about uh, in the Mishnah itself when we get there. That's the era of the Tanaim. The next era from around the year 200 to the year 500 is the era of the Amoraim. Amoraim are the rabbis in the Gemara, and they're the rabbis who are discussed and extrapolated, analyzed the words of the Tanaim themselves, and so all the rabbis in the Gemara will be called Amoraim, which means interpreters. They interpreted, explained the words of the Tanaim. We're going to skip for our purposes the era of the Savaraim and the Gaonim, and then go to the next era that's going to interest us on the page of the Gemara, and that will be the era of the Rishonim, approximately the year 1000 to 1500, and they're known as the early commentaries. So those are the three Tkufot we have to know, the Tanaim, the Amoraim, and the Rishonim. And let's go back now to our page of text. Okay, we finished our short Jewish history lesson, a little longer than a minute, maybe two and a half minutes. Come on, you got a minute, it's probably the shortest Jewish history lesson you ever heard. We're now back to our page of the Talmud. The uh, page of the Talmud, as we mentioned, we're going to focus on four areas. A uh, sugya, a topic of discussion, again called a sugya in the Talmud, always begins with a Mishnah. The Mishnah compiled by Rav Yehuda Nasi in the second century, a topic we'll discuss more in depth maybe in another lesson, um, is written in Hebrew. That's the way you always can differentiate between a Mishnah and a Gemara. The Gemara is written Aramaic and the Mishnah in Hebrew. So we always begin with a Mishnah in Hebrew 
And then the Gemara will extrapolate, discuss, analyze, try to understand, explain the Mishnah. Um, as you see here, the Mishnah here begins with a very, very nice graphic. That's because it's the beginning of the Masechet itself. The beginning of the Perak also will be easy to find the beginning of the Mishnah. When, however, the Gemara, let's say, on the Mishnah could be a very short discussion, and it could be a couple of lines long, the discussion of the Gemara could be a couple of pages long. And you may have a Mishnah that begins in the middle of a page. You're not going to have a graphic there. You will have simply only four letters. A mem, tough, nun, and yud with a slash. And that's how you know when a Mishnah is beginning. Again, always easy to tell because you'll find we've switched from the Aramaic back to the Hebrew. You'll know again a Mishnah is starting. So that's the Mishnah. The Gemara, as we mentioned before, comes to explain, understand, find sources, many, many different things the Gemara will be doing. And here is the Gemara, always beginning with a Gimel Mem and a slash. That tells us the Gemara is starting. And again, it will start in Aramaic. The Gemara written is the words of the Amoraim, the Mishnah, again, the words of the Tanaim. The Gemara, the work of the Amoraim from the year uh, 200 to 500. Again, we've discussed already. And the Gemaras, we'll see, as we mentioned before, explains the Mishnah. The third thing we're looking on the page is Rashi. The famous Rashi. Rashi's explanation on the Gemara really opened up the Gemara for understanding. Without it, it'd be almost impossible to understand the Gemara. Rashi is easy to find. He's always on the inside of the page. So Rashi is always towards the binding. Is the Rashi so on Bet Amud Aleph? Rashi would be on the right side if you would turn the page. Bet Amud Bet. Rashi would be on the left side. Again, easy to find. Just always by the binding. The column closest to the binding is always Rashi. On the uh, left side is Rashi's descendants. We know Rashi uh, lived at the beginning of the era of the Rishonim. Rashi and the Baalei Tosfot are all Rishonim. Uh, Rashi living uh, closer to the beginning of the era of the Rishonim and his descendants, the Baalei Tosfot, the French Baalei Tosfot by and large, um, were um, written over a number of years, or well over uh, close to two centuries, the Baalei Tosfot were written, and they are always on the outside of the page, as I'm showing you here, the left side of the page on Amar Aleph, and if we would turn the page, the Tosos again would be on the outside of the page, but that would then be the right side of the page. So those are the four areas that are most important. Again, Mishnah, then the Gemara, the inside towards the binding, always Rashi, and the outside of the page to the left, always the Baalei Tosfot. Rashi will give us usually the simpler explanation, and Tosfot are the analytical explanation, analyzing, comparing, contrasting different texts of the Gemara, and that pretty much gives you the page. In the next lesson, we're going to take a look at some of the indexes or other commentaries that might be found on the page of the Talmud.